I'm John Greiner. I'm the, um, the founder of Just Tech. Um, thank you so much for joining uh, uh, this last uh, webinar um, of LSNTAPS uh, on the cybersecurity series um, for 2021. And uh, I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't attended some of the past webinars, to visit the LSNTAP website. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, I'll let you know that, uh, that these webinars and, and additional material are being um, put together into a uh, cybersecurity toolkit for the legal aid community, and that's going to be available um, to um, the community in January um, through the LSNTAP website. Um, so we thought this last webinar would, would, uh, would be sort of a, a good uh, um, uh, finale to the series. Um, we've talked a lot about um, some of the different elements for managing um, cybersecurity um, uh, um, approaches for advocates to uh, navigate um, uh, their work in a more secure fashion, talked about some of the, um, the more technical um, pieces um, uh, and, and, tech, uh, and opportunities for programs to improve their security. But um, you know, as with uh, um, a lot of different disaster preparation or fire preparation, um, it's good to sort of explore um, uh, uh, the, uh, I guess, the anatomy of a cyber incident um, to understand it and to prepare for it and, and hopefully be um, better able to, uh, uh, to respond, but also maybe look for opportunities to uh, reduce the risk um, of an incident um, within your organization and, and maybe the extent of the damage and the time that it might take to recover. So. Um, so we're going to spend um, uh, some time today with, uh, with some wonderful uh, panelists who are going to bring um, the legal aid um, specific perspective, um, uh, engineering perspective on some of the, um, some of the, the, the technical details, um, as well as sort of the, the legal operational perspective um, on cyber incidents. Um, with us um, uh, specifically are uh, uh, Jada Briegel, who's the, uh, the Chief Information Officer for Legal Services Corporation. Uh, uh, Dina Brownstein, who's the IT man, uh, director for Greater Boston Legal Services, um, Joseph Mello, the director of engineering for Just Tech, um, and then on the, the legal team, um, we're very um, fortunate um, to have uh, Kaylee Schuler, uh, who's an associate at uh, Pulsinelli, um, Daniel Pepper, who's a, a partner, uh, and Elise Alam, who is an associate both at uh, Baker Hostetler. Um, uh, and I, I think what we, we want to do is, is sort of go through um, some questions sort of laying out um, sort of the typical uh, progress of a cyber incident, but, um, but we also want your questions and comments. Um, so if you would please make sure you use the chat um, to share um, uh, your experience, your, 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 uh, your knowledge, uh, your questions. Um, we're going to be uh, uh, you know, keeping tabs on that chat. We're going to either integrate your questions into the, um, the dialogue um, or depending on the nature of the question, we, we will try to answer them at the end of the session. Um, so uh, with that, I, I think I'd like to um, uh, kick it off with uh, um, a question um, to Jada um, to begin with. And, and that's uh, why, um, uh, why the legal aid community should really care and care about and prepare for cyber incidents. And I have a couple slides that I'm going to share to answer that question. So hopefully that is visible to all. Um, the first slide here has an infographic from the FBI. And you can see from 2019 to 2020, um, internet crime complaints are going up significantly. Uh, in addition to that, downtime due to ransomware is on average 21 days. So this is, uh, this is big and we need to care. We haven't seen 2021 um, information yet. I also pulled um, some cybercrime statistics also from that FBI report that our OIG uses. And um, I think what's important here is business email compromise, which is something we see a lot of, continued to be very costly, uh, $1.8 billion, phishing over 54 million, um, and a lot of ransomware incidents. The other thing that I found that I thought was interesting is there's a ransomware um, attack on a business. It's estimated every 21, 11, uh, 21 seconds, 
11 seconds, I'm sorry, I can't even re read my own slides. And it's expected that that's gonna go to every two seconds. So I think we need to realize that cybercrime is really big business. And even though we're nonprofits for the most part, we're running businesses and we are a target. And then I just wanted to show some stats that we keep track of at LSC. Our Office of Inspector General logs cybersecurity events um, for us at LSC and our grantees. And since 2018, they've logged 27. I'm not sure that they've actually seen all of them. Um, a lot of these are phishing incidents. And what I see happening more and more is that, is that someone's email gets hacked and everyone in their address book starts getting uh, fishy emails. And I think it's important to remember that we're all connected. We're a supply chain of sorts. Uh, so if you have a cyber event in our community, you can impact the rest of us. Thank you, Jada. And I, I gotta say, we, we were sort of privileged to work with both LSC and non-LSC funded um, uh, uh, legal aid providers. And we certainly see um, quite a few cyber incidents. So I, I know that outside of the LSC world, you're not immune to cyber incidents. Um, uh, and in some ways, I think, again, we, um, I think that one of the wonderful things about LSNTAP is that we're really trying to help bring up the whole community's understanding and knowledge and, and improve the practices of the broader community. And I think to Jada's point that we're interconnected. And so, um, you know, our, our security is really dependent um, on the, on the broader network our you know, our joint security. Um, so wanted, um, I guess, you know, to the, the extent that, uh, um, again, we have um, a range of, uh, of um, folks from across the, the country and the community, um, if you wouldn't mind sort of sharing a little bit of your, um, uh, your perspective and, and just in the chat, what you're, um, you know, sort of most concerned about why you care about cyber incidents and cybersecurity. Um, I think that would be sort of helpful as we sort of proceed. And, and, uh, and again, any questions that you have that you wanna make sure we try to answer. Um, so I, as I mentioned, we've got um, uh, um, some uh, great practitioners who are doing cybersecurity um, incident work and, and preparation work, you know, sort of the preventative work as well and the management work as well with us um, uh, this afternoon. Um, and having um, sort of their experience, I think I, I'm just really delighted by because we, you know, we see a number of incidents every year, they see many, many more. And so I, I think we're, we're looking forward to um, sort of hearing sort of more, um, uh, getting more of a, of a sort of the big picture about how cyber incidents unfold. And I, my question uh, first to, to Kaylee, Dan and Elise is um, uh, if, you know, maybe if you could share how um, how firms typically identify, um, uh, you know, that, that there's been some compromise um, and maybe the, the sorts of incidents that you're seeing that, that you're getting involved in. Um, and, uh, and I guess to the extent that, uh, um, you know, that there's some question about whether, you know, um, uh, some activity on the network or with the system is a cyber, is related to some sort of malicious cyber activity, or if it's um, just a poor configuration or, or poor, poor management of the technology, if, you know, like how does that sort of play into the whole um, process of, of getting to the point where you're um, uh, responding to something that you think um, uh, needs all hands on deck. Yeah, John, I'm happy to um, kind of kick off the discussion there. It, it's a really good question. Um, and I think the answer can really vary in terms of how, how and, and when a, an entity starts to understand that it's dealing with a breach or a possible breach. Um, so it kind of in terms of the main types of incidents that I'm seeing come across my desk, um, you know, I think there are probably four that most incidents probably fall into, four categories. Um, so first, you know, with some regularity, we'll see a pretty straightforward case of something like it, an inadvertent disclosure, right? So this is where, um, you know, somebody accidentally mails the wrong document or attaches the wrong document to an email and then sends that out to uh, an unintended recipient. Um, so in those cases, you know, occasionally an employee might, you know, notice right off the bat that they've made an error, but more often that's coming onto the business's radar when they hear from that unintended recipient who's saying, you know, I got, I got something that doesn't pertain to me, what's, what's going on. Um, 
Another type of incident we see with some regularity is uh, kind of the lost device incident, um, you know, where employee is on vacation and loses their cell phone um, or uh, was recently dealing with a client whose vehicle was stolen. Um, and it just happened that her work computer was in the car when it got stolen. Um, so again, in those cases, um, you know, as soon as the employee reports the incident, um, the, the business is aware and, and ready to start responding. In the more technical type of incidents, it's not always um, obvious as quickly that something is going on. And as you heard from Jada, kind of the two types of more technical incidents that we're seeing frequently um, it, are the business email compromises and the ransomware incidents. Um, so a, a business email compromise involves an unauthorized party, we often call them a threat actor, um, getting into the email account of, of someone in the organization. They're often able to do that using um, what we call a phishing email. So it's, it's as you may know, an, an email that is designed to look legitimate and to dupe that recipient into voluntarily providing their, their credentials, their username and password. And then, you know, once inside, we see the attacker doing one of a couple of things, um, kind of to Jada's point, often we'll see them sending out uh, additional spam emails, right? So kind of getting that person's contact list and then purporting to be them, sending out a bunch of additional emails trying to collect more credentials. Um, the other thing we will see them do is try to identify a ongoing conversation about a, a payment and try to insert themselves into the middle of that and kind of, again, by being tricky, pretending to be other people, uh, redirect a payment that's supposed to go, say, to a vendor. Uh, they'll, they'll kind of trick someone into sending payment to a, a account that is controlled by that threat actor. So, um, you know, in terms of how a company is going to identify that one of those things is happening, occasionally we'll see, you know, technical controls that are in place that might start to kind of tip off IT. So, you know, maybe you've got uh, an alert that would be triggered if thousands of emails were going out of one account in a very short period of time. Um, I think more commonly we see businesses become aware that something has happened when, you know, the recipient of one of those phishing emails reaches out to say, you know, something strange is happening. I got this from you. I don't think it's legit. Um, or in, you know, what can be an extremely frustrating situation whenever um, an issue arises around the payment, right? So you paid a bill, you thought you'd paid a bill, and then a month later, the person you thought you paid is reaching out to ask you, when are you going to pay that bill? At which point you go back and realize um, the person you thought you were dealing with via email was actually an attacker that had um, gotten into, into your account. Um, and then lastly, with respect to ransomware incidents, um, and I guess as, as preface, uh, a ransomware incident involves an attacker getting into your system, um, again, kind of with the um, financial motivation uh, here, their, their method is extortion, right? So they get into your systems and then they lock everything up, um, encrypt your files such that you cannot access any of your uh, files. Um, and then the extortion can come in two forms and, and more and more we're seeing attackers kind of use both. Uh, one is, you know, telling you that if you would like to unlock your data, get access to your data again, you will need to purchase uh, a tool from them that will allow you to unlock your files. Um, or two, and again, often in combination, they will say that, you know, before we locked up your files, we also stole copies of some of your data that is sensitive. And if you pay us, we will delete it. If you don't pay us, we will publish it on the dark web. So in terms of how that type of incident is being discovered, again, there may be some controls in place that are identifying things like, you know, large volumes of data being copied out of the network. I'm working with a client right now who, who had that. They kind of uh, had technical controls in place that uh, helped them spot that a lot of data was going out. Um, and so they were actually able to stop the encryption piece from happening, although they were not able to stop the exfiltration piece. Uh, but I would say more often, you know, we're seeing clients were in a position where employees came to work in the morning and they couldn't get on their computer. Maybe they even, you know, could see a digital ransom note that had been left behind that's displaying on their screen that, you know, is the threat actor saying you've been hacked and if you'd like to discuss payment, contact us. Um, so that's, that's a lot of information and welcome um, Dan and Elisa's thoughts as well. If they have other thoughts about how kind of these things typically 
um, get on get on a um, business's radar. And, and I know as the conversation goes on, we'll talk about you know, wh where a person goes from there. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Kaylee. That's that's a great great description um, and explanation of what we typically see. Um, a couple other things that I find when we are talking about how do organizations ultimately determine that there's been an issue. Um, so Kaylee mentioned um, business email compromises. Um, and in those situations, the threat actor typically does not want to make itself known um, because they want to continue the damage as long as they can. They want to continue to be able to redirect emails or get inserted into the payment um, um, process between, let's say, an organization and their vendor. And as long as they can continue to stay in the environment not get caught, so much the better for them. Um, on the other hand, ransomware, the threat actor wants to be known. The ransomware actor will leave a ransom note in most cases saying, this is what we've done and, and we've locked your files up. And if you want um, to recover your data, um, including data that we may have stolen and, and potentially will publish on the internet, here's how to contact us. And once you've done that, they'll demand a payment. Uh, so they're very upfront about it. Um, so it really depends on the motivation of the threat actor. In some cases, we'll also see different types of intrusions where um, organizations very frequently now will use different types of cloud service providers uh, or cloud services to either store data, run certain operations or systems, um, and they're dependent upon the third parties uh, to ensure that their data is being protected correctly. Um, in those situations, third parties can be subject or those vendors can be subject to different types of security incidents that impact their customers. Um, and so in those situations, oftentimes once that vendor discovers that there's been some sort of an intrusion or other incident, they'll notify um, the organization that's been affected by it. Um, so it really will depend ultimately on the nature of the intrusion. And one thing I'll, I'll just mention, um, this is a common question that, that we get pretty frequently. Um, whether or not certain types of organizations are targets more than others. Um, there oftentimes is an assumption that, you know, the bigger organizations with the deep pockets, the ability to pay more, are, are more um, frequent or, or attractive targets. And we find that unless, if we, in certain circumstances and exceptions, where you may have, let's say, a nation state actor, which is intentionally targeting a particular type of industry or company, most threat actors are opportunistic. Um, they will get in whenever they can. If there's a phishing email uh, or a campaign that a threat actor is instituting, um, whoever takes the bait, that's where they'll go. Um, it can be a multinational conglomerate. It can be a two-person CPA firm. It can be a small nonprofit organization. It really doesn't matter. So at least may have some other thoughts on that too. Yes, I just wanted to echo what Dan just said at the end there that, you know, we often work with um, companies that or organizations that prior to dealing with us didn't think that they could be a target and didn't think they needed to worry about this type of thing. So going back to what Jada was talking about at the beginning of uh, the presentation, this is something that every organization does need to care about and plan for because everyone, unfortunately, is a target. That's, that's really helpful. And, and I think it, it really wonderful to, to point out that, again, there, there's a whole range of different types of cyber incidents too. And some of them, uh, you know, um, as, as you've just discussed, are, um, are sort of long-term compromises and they want to use your infrastructure. I, I, I remember years and years ago um, uh, going into a, um, an office that, um, that had um, one of its servers full and, and they couldn't figure out why the server was full. Well, it, it had been compromised back when people wanted to store, I think, you know, video files or games, like they were basically using them as free cloud storage. And that's why they didn't have any room for, for their client files. So, um, so some of this um, is not necessarily shutting down your entire operation, um, but it's, it's leveraging your operation either, you know, sort of for some um, you know, financial transaction or, or to attack others. So, um, so there is a, a pretty broad range. Joseph, do you have anything you'd like to add um, in terms of sort of awareness, uh, you know, um, around cyber incidents and when, you know, when, when they're occurring? Uh, yes, yeah, so as uh, Kayla was mentioning earlier, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different alerts that an IT administrator can receive and should be receiving about sort of what's happening in the environment. So things like um, unusual sign-in activity from your email from Office 365 or G Suite saying, 
you know, um, Elise is always in New York and she signs in in New York and that's a normal occurrence. But then suddenly she signs in from Russia, China, India, all in the same day, which is just seemingly not possible. So uh, in those situations, you either need an administrator to act immediately or, you know, have a system in place that will act on your behalf and immediately lock out that account and then run through the procedure of, of checking with the user because you never know, maybe they figured out a way to teleport. But you could also figure out if um, if that is malicious activity that's happening, the password should be reset. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess back to um, uh, to Kaylee, Dan, and Elise. Um, so once you know, again, once a firm recognizes that there's some sort of cyber incident or breach or or some sort of compromise, um, could you maybe walk through what you think of as as some of the most important next steps? Or an sure, I'll, I'll take the lead on, on that one to get us started. So I think, you know, I'll discuss sort of at a high level, but I it can depend on the type of incident that you're experiencing, sort of what your first steps or next steps would be. You, you may address it differently if it's, you know, an inadvertent disclosure versus a business email compromise versus a ransomware incident where your entire network is shut down and you can't do anything or access any of your data. Um, so with that being said, though, I think the, the first step really, once you know you're dealing with some type of cyber incident, is to identify internal and external resources to help you address the incident. Um, and so you, many of your organizations may have an incident response plan or you've heard of one. And in, in my experience, I don't really see uh, organizations get out their incident response plan and follow it step by step um, during the incident, especially during a ransomware incident. I see the value in in having the incident response plan as sort of identifying the resources, internal and external, that an organization has, and identifying the people that need to be involved uh, in the incident, in responding to the incident. So having those ducks in a row prior to an incident is really valuable. So, you know, once you've identified those people, you've escalated to the people within your organization that, that need to know about the incident, really your next step would be, and, and there's sort of things that you do in parallel, um, but those would include reaching out to your cybersecurity um, insurance carrier. Uh, sometimes that might be through your broker if you have one, um, and they will help line you up with external resources, including legal counsel. Uh, and then typically if legal counsel gets involved, we would then help you um, ad identify and engage additional external resources, including forensic um, firms that would help perform an investigation as well as to make sure that the incident is contained. Uh, and so it's not spreading or or there's, um, we wanna make sure that if the um, threat actor is in your, your email accounts or uh, in your system somewhere that we kick them out and keep them out. Um, and so th things like that, um, if we're dealing with a ransomware incident, we may also want to engage a third party negotiation firm that focuses on um, communicating with uh, threat actors uh, in ransomware incidents to, you know, and there can be a lot of reasons why you might want to do that, even if you don't actually need a decryption tool because you have viable backups, you still may want to uh, communicate with the threat actor to figure out how they got in, if they'll tell you um, it, what they what data they took, things like that. Um, and these firms um, specialize in, in that type of communication. Um, we You may also need um, technical support, firms that we call helping hands. Um, that essentially are there to augment or supplement your existing IT uh, infrastructure. So either your internal IT or your external IT firms that help you on a day-to-day -day basis, you may need extra hands on deck to respond to an incident. Um, and there are firms that specialize in that as well. Um, and finally, um, related to sort of external resources, there are some incidents where we may think about engaging um, a crisis communications firm. Typically, law firms who are helping you through an incident would be able to assist with any communications, but there are some situations where we might need um, a third-party crisis comms firm to help um, manage sort of any, you know, like social media posts or news uh, coverage of an incident, which can happen, especially if it's a large organization hit by ransomware. Um, and so sort of kind of 
um, talking about communications, you know, and, and these things are sort of happening in parallel as, as well. It's not all, it's not like a one step after the other, it's all happening at once. Um, and, you know, you need to think about who are you communicating with and what you're communicating to those people. So you have internal stakeholders, um, some of them, they might have to communicate to a board, for example. So, you know, trying to figure out um, and make a plan for communicating with those stakeholders, as well as external stakeholders. Um, you may have contractual obligations to, to you know, notify um, partners that you have. Um, but you also need to think about what you need to communicate with staff. Um, in a business email compromise, you may not need to notify or discuss with anyone other than the party whose email is involved, um, but you may need to notify you know, somebody that received a phishing email, somebody outside of your organization. In the event of a ransomware incident, you may need to tell employees, um, give them instructions on what they need to do. Um, if everything is shut down, do you tell them to go home? Um, you know, what do you tell them? So, you know, sort of ha having um, that in, in mind, that those communication plans and Legal counsel is there to help you through through all of that too, which is why it's important to to get us involved. Um, but but those are all really important um, things, sort of early on in managing an incident and responding to an incident. And in the case of a ransomware incident, um, it's really um, critical to have a way to communicate internally, as well as with your third party um, vendors that are helping you respond to the incident. Uh, sort of out of band is what we call it. So basically not in your own system. So normally you'd be emailing each other or using Teams or Skype or something like that to communicate with each other in order to respond to the incident. And, and when we identify an incident, we don't know right away what the threat actor has access to, what they can see. And oftentimes they have visibility into um, Teams or email, things like that. And we obviously don't want the threat actor privy to our discussions on responding to an incident. So our recommendation typically is to create brand new like Gmail or other free email accounts specifically just for this incident with MFA, make sure you have multi-factor authentication on, on those um, so that you can communicate securely um, and confidentially in, in responding to um, the incident. Because we have uh, heard of incidents where the threat actor actually was, you know, it, viewing all of the email communications um, or, you know, the in the team's responses or even, um, you know, joining calls. Um, and so we don't want that to happen to, to anybody. Um, and, and some other things regarding communications, um, we often notify law enforcement early on. In the case of a business email compromise, we often will notify the Secret Service. Uh, they have a task force um, that is geared directly toward um, addressing uh, business email compromises and can sometimes help get funds back that have been paid to a threat actor. Um, and uh, in the case of a ransomware incident, we would notify the FBI uh, field office that is responsible for handling and investigating the particular variant involved. Um, they don't um, come in. I see in TV and movies, you know, the FBI will come storming in with their laptops and, you know, they're all hands on deck, um, helping you through an incident. They don't do that in real life. Um, they do help give us some information about a threat actor, give us some um, data points that may help us in our response efforts. Um, but really, it, it's great to have them as a partner, but it's really just a notification that we, we just let them know that that's going on. Um, and then I'll just sort of very high level talk about notification obligations. I won't go too into the weeds because it's very specific to every incident, but these types of incidents do sometimes and more often, as Kaylee mentioned, you know, when data is being taken by these threat actors, there can be notification obligations to regulators and to individuals, uh, which is another reason why it's important to have legal counsel help you through these incidents. And then finally, just a couple points on some communication sort of missteps that I've seen. Um, you know, really, you want to be careful um, about what you're communicating and how you're communicating it. Um, you know, I, I really applaud organizations that want to be transparent, but sometimes 
being too transparent or giving too much information too early can backfire. Um, and, you know, we, we see, you know, if we'd say too much now, for example, if we say personal information wasn't involved, and then a week later we find out actually the threat actor took data. And then we have to walk back those statements. That's, you know, not a good look. And we want to make sure that we're being strategic about our communications. And just one specific example to end with is that just recently I was um, working on a ransomware incident with a large nonprofit and they had had a, uh, an employee click on a phishing link um, right before the encryption event, maybe two days before the encryption event happened. So the InfoSec team uh, assumed that that was the cause of the incident. And they told everybody internally and even some external stakeholders that the cause of the incident was phishing. Um, and it turns out that that was just a coincidence and the phishing uh, incident had nothing to do with the ransomware incident. And so although it didn't really affect anything from a legal standpoint, it just wasn't a great look, um, you know, for the InfoSec team who worked really hard and, you know, did a great job responding to the incident, but having to sort of walk back these things where, you know, they were very definite statements that ended up not being correct. So, you know, just wanting to be strategic about those things when we're responding to an incident, especially in the early days, um, when we really don't know a lot of what, what occurred um, is really important. Wonderful. Thank you, Elise. Um, I don't know, Dan or, or Kaylee, do you, would you like to add anything to that? Just, just one other um, consideration I wanted to throw out there, and that's the importance of maintaining attorney-client privilege um, in the communications as well. So it is not uncommon for an external firm um, or outside counsel to engage a forensics firm and other third-party vendors under privilege, um, where the purpose of the investigation is to be able to provide uh, enough information to external counsel to provide legal advice uh, to the client. Um, so whether there are certain analyses or conclusions that are reached based upon what these forensics firms are finding, we want to ensure that those are protected under privilege. Especially important because we do see a fair amount of litigation that often can arise out of these incidents if there's personal information that's been compromised, credit card numbers, if there's a risk of identity theft. Um, depending upon the volume of that information, the number of individuals affected, that certainly can increase um, the risk of, of, uh, of some sort of class action litigation. So ensuring that privilege is maintained um, is important. The second piece is instructing um, the client to ensure that the way they're communicating about the incident, either internally or externally, is discussed. Really, really key. Um, many cases we've seen complaints filed where uh, Exhibit A, um, is an email that's given by some information security or IT folks about, you know, gosh, you know, we knew it was only a matter of time um, that this vulnerability would have come back to bite us. And gosh, you know, if we only decided to spend more money and increase our budget to improve our security, this may never have happened. The exact sort of thing um, that the plaintiff's bar loves to see. So ensuring that, you know, during, well, it's really before, during, and after an incident, but certainly during an incident, really working with clients to understand the effective ways to communicate, not to draw conclusions, um, not to use certain legal terms of art, which can have certain ramifications if they're used, um, and really ensuring that we're, they're not drawing any sorts of conclusions based upon oftentimes very really limited information um, when it, it occurs. So that's an important concept too, I think. Wonderful. Kaylee? Yeah, no, I think that's, um, all very true and, and completely agree with everything that both Dan and Elise said. I think the only thing I would add is just a quick plug for um, evidence preservation. Uh, um, I'm going to try to avoid swerving into Joseph's lane here, but um, I think early on, there's always a tension between kind of containing the incident, getting back up and running, and particularly I'm thinking about ransomware incidents. Um, but also preserving that evidence that the forensic team is going to ultimately need in order to give us the best chance of understanding what happened. Um, so I, I just put that in your mind to kind of, um, you know, be thinking about that. Um, you know, we sometimes have situations where kind of in order to contain an incident, clients have kind of wiped everything that they thought was infected, um, which can result in containing, but also in losing that evidence. So um, it, it's just kind of 
it's challenging, but even in those early hours, kind of thinking down the road about, about um, kind of giving yourself the best chance to fully understand what happened can be really helpful. Uh, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's really interesting that, that, uh, and again, we've, I guess, had the privilege of, of, uh, of working on some of these incidents and helping organizations recover, but, but yeah, the, the communication, the language we use, I mean, I think it, this is not stuff I think that you would just normally um, uh, assume that that's what you should be doing. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear a lot of this. And, and I hope that, um, that again, that, 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 you know, that uh, as I think folks tend to um, err on the side of transparency, that we check ourselves a little bit to make sure that we do really fully understand and that we bring in the forensic expertise that we, you know, what we think we know, we may not really know. And so, um, we've got to be careful and it's, you know, for liability reasons, but also for confidence and trust reasons. If we're, you know, if we're not, uh, if we're making misstatements along the way, when we're recovering from something that can be kind of traumatic, um, for a lot of people. Um, so the next question is, uh, is for, uh, Jada and Dina, um, I'm sorry, Jada, Dina and Joseph, um, and, and this, uh, Kaylee, thank you for the transition, um, you know, kind of shifts us back to what providers should be um, sort of uh, doing early on on the tech front. Um, uh, and obviously there are a range of different incidents. So, you know, if it's just, if it's an email account that's compromised, it's one thing, but but could you maybe share some of your um, your experience, your thoughts on, on sort of the initial um, technical response? I, I can start. Um, I would say, first of all, put someone in charge. You need a battle captain sort of person to manage the incident, and it should be someone who has the authority to tell people what to do, um, and they should manage it throughout. Um, I would also say contact the experts as quickly as possible. Um, call your insurance company. Um, get these folks like we're talking to today involved immediately or as soon as you can, because while I have a wonderful IT staff, we don't deal with these incidents every day. And we could make really bad missteps um, if we do the wrong things. And so I really, this happened at LSC last December, December 2nd to be exact, when we um, realized we had a pretty bad incident on our hands. Um, I really welcomed the experts in and took their advice. Dina, do you want to, uh, what are your thoughts? And you're muted, sorry. Uh, um, Okay. Blah, blah, blah. There we go. Boy, I'm really, I'm really batting a thousand today, aren't I, folks? Sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm gonna hi Jada. I'm gonna echo what Jada said. Um, we were fortunate to have um, cyber insurance, um, which gave us access to all of the experts that you all have been talking to today. And I can't. Um, we had two attacks in in the past year that were just a couple of months apart. Um, and I can't imagine, um, you know, sort of going through any of this without having the full team of um, the law firm, the cyber forensics, all of the stuff you've been talking about. Um, Joseph, who um, was our, is our um, external engineering team, um, who knew exactly what to do, um, getting in touch with the insurance company right away, um, that sort of whole first level of panic where you have to you know, assess the damage and stop, you know, make sure that someone's looking at stopping whatever might be going on, figuring out how to get your now completely overwhelmed panic staff um, password reset so they can at least get into 365 and you can't use any of your usual channels. So how are you going to figure out how to get the information to people so that they can at least continue to do their work somewhat? And then third, how are you going to communicate with them going on? All your systems are compromised. You know what are you going to do and how are you going to do that? Um, and you know that was the, that was our sort of in the in the days and hours that followed um, both of our attacks. That those were our sort of three um, primary focuses: security, access, and communication. And I'll let Joseph say how all that happened since he's the one that did it. Um, so yeah, so as Dina and I think um, others have mentioned before, there's. The importance of a the cybersecurity, a cyber um, 
incident response plan is having that plan in place so that you don't have to do any thinking in these situations because there it is a bit of a panic moment a bit is an understatement um but it is it is something you don't want to have to think about you just kind of want to look at the plan and be told what to do in these situations and that's always helpful um but i'd say what you know you certainly want to do is, is establish that communication you certainly want to establish what's really happening you know make sure you know confirm that there has been attack there has been a security breach what's the extent of it look at the logs look at um, the activity that's been going on, if it's been happening at three in the morning, if it's been happening from other countries, if your systems are somewhat interconnected, for instance, if your Office 365 is connected with your Active Directory and, and the attacker managed to get into Office 365, there's a very high potential that they could have gotten into your internal network via VPN or remote desktop or whatever method you use. So if there is leakage there. You want to sort of dive into all these systems and confirm what the, the real damage is. And you do want to avoid, um, uh, you know, certain steps. Like for instance, you don't want to go in there as an IT administrator, start wiping everything, because that's that's uh, a very big mistake in terms of forensics. I and mean, you want to know what's going on. You want to know what's there. I mean, if the if it was a ransomware attack and they left the ransomware note and you're blowing it away, then there's really no way to sort of get a an encryption key if that's something that you need in your in your situation or to to be able to talk and negotiate with the attackers about whatever they may have exfiltrated from the environment um so yes yeah, certainly there's things there with with wiping things there's also the consideration of how do you deal with the systems that you know are infected um and so you know there is a step of shutting down a server for instance but then that also eliminates uh, the memory that's running on that server, which again can be collected for forensic purposes. So your best bet is to actually, if it's a physical server, disconnect the NIC, or if it's a virtual server, dis disable the virtual NIC so that you can kind of put it in an isolated state. It'll be running Windows, but it won't sort of have access to anything else in the environment and hopefully stop the spread of infection if that's what's happening. Um, but you'll want to sort of do that with your servers. And then on your firewalls, you, you essentially want to lock everything down. There's There should be nothing coming in and out of your environment at that precise moment other than IT for management purposes. So all outbound internet traffic, all internal access to your network, everything has to stop, which is what can be the most devastating part because this is why it takes on an average 21 days to sort of come back to a full stage of recovery, even if if that's accurate. And I think that could even be longer depending on what the damage is. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you wanna sort of lock things down as best as possible in those situations and then figure out who needs that limited access. So IT obviously is gonna need that access, but working with other staff members, maybe pulling certain very specific key data from a file server if attorneys need it for a very specific case, you know, plucking out what, what's needed in the environment to help at least get some of the business continuing to move as safely as possible. And Joseph, I'll just, I just want to add something. When, when we talked offline that, that you mentioned that I think uh, is, is worth uh, just, again, throwing out there that the value of documentation can't be overstated, that um, the better your documentation is on your whole environment, you know, in-house and in the cloud, um, the easier it will be for you and others to help assess, you know, how do we get, get at least get control of it and, and not necessarily destroy evidence, but, but, but mitigate the ongoing harm um, or the data exfiltration. So um, to next um, uh, question, um, again, back to our legal gurus um, uh, in terms of how cyber incidents typically progress. So we've, we've, we've identified it. Um, we've sort of gotten the initial um, communication going with, with the management um uh what's what's the i guess the anatomy of not the murder but the incident that uh, um that folks should uh, um uh, should understand sort of the, the typical progression um from first from denial through to acceptance or whatever the <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can start with that and by the way the mur murder is not a bad analogy because i'll tell you um for most organizations it's the worst day in their professional lives having to go through this so it feels like your business has, has been killed in many ways uh, and I just wanted to follow up on the point that you made, John, and, um, and Joseph as well about the incident response plan. And this kind of ties into this point as well about what you can expect and what the timing look like and what does this look like when it progresses. Um, not only is it important to have very well written incident response plan that's been tested to or that the organization has gone through, they know it, they know how to, um, to proceed with it, um, but to actually have it printed out in hard copy. I worked with an organization not long ago that was hit with the ransomware and their beautifully written incident response plan was encrypted and no one could get to it. 
Oh, so we won't have the opportunity to actually see it and follow it. Um, so have it printed, have it uh, sitting on everyone's desk uh, or in their office so they can grab a, a hard copy of it. Along with phone numbers and email addresses because those also can be encrypted so you don't know how to contact anybody. Um, so just a little, uh, little aside there. Um, but as far as the timeline goes, so um, you know, in some situations, and I think um, a number of the folks, including Jada, um, mentioned the importance of moving quickly and bringing in those experts quickly once you've discovered the incident. Um, we find in some situations that organizations, especially those that, you know, need to get back up and running very quickly, they may be losing money on the, on the hour, every, you know, hour they're down. So their first instinct is let's get everything restored. Let's get everything back up and running, and then we'll start to figure out what happened because we've got to get the business up and running. Perfectly understandable. Um, you know, we it's it, it, I use the you know the the analogy where you have this great forensics process um, where you know um, we stopped everything, we got all the forensic information and all the evidence over to the firm for them to investigate it, um, but the business ultimately couldn't survive. So you know the, the operation was a success, but the patient died, right? Not so much a good example of, a, of, of, a, of the result that you want. So um, sometimes in those situations, a forensics firm may come in a couple of days later after the restoration has already occurred. There's no evidence left. It's all been wiped. There's nothing to do. Um, and so there's a very good chance, and we see this a lot, that you haven't actually ejected the bad guy from the systems, um, and you're just going to be waiting for another attack because you know they're just lying in wait. Um, but in general, the forensic firm is there to do the what, where, when, when who, and why. Um, how, do we, how did this happen, um, and how do we prevent this from happening again? Um, the process, uh, and just to kind of give you some numbers here of what you can expect, this is based upon what we've tracked uh, as part of our team um, each year. So in, in 2020, uh, our team worked a little over 1,250 security incidents uh, on behalf uh, of our clients. And on average, the, the point in which the initial occurrence of the incident um, begins to the point of discovery is on average about 12 days, um, which generally means that you've got the threat actor that's in the environment undetected uh, until they make themselves known or you have an IT administrator or somebody else discover uh, the threat actor is there. Once the forensics firm ultimately is engaged, on average, it takes about 36 days um, based on our experience for the forensic investigation to complete. Why does it take so long? Why does it take 36 days on average um, to complete that? So there's a few different moving parts here. Um, there is oftentimes a lot of evidence that the forensic firm is looking to collect. There could be lots of systems, lots of different locations that the organization has, um, all with different types of logs, images of systems um, that need to be collected while everyone is scrambling just to keep the business running. That can take some time. Finding ways in which to collect that and actually transmit that to the forensics firm so they can start investigating that. Um, once that's all collected, depending upon the volume of that information, it's going to take some time to parse through that. Um, and so that's kind of built into that 36-day that uh, average time frame. Um, so what are they looking for? And what does this process typically look like? Well, obviously on day one, I think there's a number of folks have mentioned, you want to get the bad guy out, you want to get containment so that the infection is not ongoing. We also want to identify what type of information they've been impacted. Um, has there been, apart from just maybe encryption in the event of a ransomware incident, um, I think as Kaylee mentioned early on, it's very common now for these ransomware actors to steal data as a second extortion method. So if you've got good backups of your data and you don't need to actually purchase a decryption key from the threat actor to decrypt your data, well, the threat actors say, look, you know what? We'll also steal your data and threaten to publish it um, as in another way to extort you uh, to actually pay the ransom. Um, so how do we know whether or not this is something that we care about? Part of the forensic investigation is going to identify to what extent if possible any data was actually taken, how much, what type, when was it taken, et cetera, so we can make a determination of, you know, do we need even need to get into uh, discussions with a threat actor uh, to prevent that data from being published. Um, it's a particular risk because threat actors, um, especially some of the more sophisticated ones, 
um, are better at identifying what sensitive information an organization has. Um, they know, and these are not business uh, majors by any stretch or, or you know, financial or accounting experts, but they know enough that social security numbers are important. They know enough that financial account numbers are important. That's going to get an organization's attention. They're going to know that if employee social security numbers are threatened to be released or credit card numbers, that's going to get the attention of the victim organization and generally going to get you to start communicating with a threat actor to potentially negotiate with them. So we want to be able to determine as best we can as part of the forensic process what information may have been compromised. Sometimes a threat actor will give you examples of what they've taken. Sometimes in the ransom note, they'll say, we've stolen data from you. And once you've initiated those communications, sometimes they'll give you some examples of what has been taken. Um, once you've seen those, generally you can say, well, I know where that type of information was stored in my system, so I can look to see what else might have been in that same file folder, on that same server. Um, and I can then start to extrapolate, well, there's a good chance they may have taken more of that same type of information. Um, so when does it make sense to negotiate? Uh, very common question we get from most of our clients, especially in ransomware matters, you know, should I pay the ransom? Um, and the truth is there's no really right or wrong answer here. Some organizations will have philosophical positions that we just are not going to negotiate terrorists or extortionists, we're not going to pay criminals, we're just not doing. Sometimes they'll build that into their own policies. Um, it's just, you know, thou shalt not pay um, criminals, we're not going to pay ransom. Um, well, that might be fine um, until you find yourself in a situation where you don't have any other option. Um, the business literally is going to shut down because you have everything locked up, you can't get access to your data, you can't run your operations, your applications, you can't service your customers, unless you're actually paying for decryption. Um, tough spot to be in. That oftentimes can be an easy decision point because we don't have any other options. But oftentimes you find yourself or the client finds itself somewhere in the middle where maybe you've got some backups, maybe you don't. We're not quite sure because no one's checked them for a while. Um, or we've got some backups that are maybe 30 days old, 60 days old, maybe older. Can we work with those? Maybe. Maybe we can. Um, so now we have to start going through this process of determining, you know, what is the value of trying to restore data or rebuild or recreate data versus taking data that might be old? You know, can we still work from that? Um, and of course, you know, what is the threat actor demanding? Um, you know, depending upon the organization, whether there's cyber insurance that will cover all or some of that ransom payment, um, and whether or not um, ultimately the value of decrypting that data is worth the, the actual uh, value of the decryption key. Um, so those are all determinations as well. Once data has been compromised, especially personal information, um, so once it's been encrypted, once there's some evidence from the forensics firm that that sensitive or personal information has been accessed. Generally at that point, most state breach notification laws are gonna require individuals to be notified if their sensitive personal information has been compromised or accessed. Many times state regulators have to be contacted as well. So whether or not that data ultimately is released by the threat actor because they stole it, won't change the obligation to notify those individuals. So if you have to notify those individuals anyway, does it really make sense to pay the threat actor to suppress the publication of that data if we have to notify affected individuals anyway? So many organizations will take the position, it really doesn't really help us that much, and it's really not worth um, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars more to pay a ransom to prevent data um, that ultimately is subject to notification obligations. Um, another question that comes up, well, if that data is ultimately released, do I need to worry about potential liability uh, as my as an organization? Uh, what does this mean for my employees, my customers, other third parties whose information has been impacted? Um, what do I need to concern myself with? Um, the first thing I generally tell folks is most threat actors, they will have what they call their leak sites. These are the sites where they will publish the data that they've stolen if a ransom payment isn't made. Generally, this is not the type of site that you're just going to Google and find. So if you're typing in, you know, my, if my data was compromised or stolen as a result of one of these incidents, and you type in, you know, Dan Pepper's social security number, chances are it's not going to come up. 
um, in the search result. There's a little bit of effort required in order to get to that information. Um, so it's not readily available. But many of these threat actors, what they will do is there's a secondary market on the dark web where they'll look to monetize that data if they're going to publish it. So they'll look to potentially share that or sell that with other threat actors um, in a downstream effect to try to monetize or make some money off of that data or potentially use that for some sort of identity theft purposes. Um, so those are all things to consider. And those all potentially raise liability risks if you're considering whether or not to pay the ransom um, and depending upon the volume of the information, the sensitivity of that information, as I mentioned earlier, that might increase litigation risk. So that's part of the consideration too. And th thank you so much. And um, and again, I mean, I, I think that the uh, the value of uh, of sort of working through each organization, sort of working through how this might progress, understanding maybe some of the variables. Um, so that, that you're better prepared. I, I'm just, you know, again, I, I really appreciate sort of understanding, you know, again, from your experience and, and Elise and, and Kaylee and Jada and Dina's, you know, that, that, uh, that this um, uh, is, is just a really valuable exercise and, and it might even be worth, um, uh, you know, some of the providers to, to really do sort of a mock cyber incident and, and, and try to walk through how that, you know, that, that fire drill, how that would really sort of unfold and test it like we test um, some of our disaster recovery preparations. Um, thanks again to LSC's leadership and helping to kind of move the community forward in, in, on that front. Um, I want to, um, uh, because of the, where we're at on time, um, I want to actually sort of move forward um, a little bit in terms of, again, the re recovery, um, uh, uh, you know, any kind of additional sort of recovery um, pieces that, that uh, Jada, you or, or Dina or Joseph want to add. And if you could each maybe take about a minute on that because I want to make sure um, I haven't seen too many questions, but I want to make, make sure that we um, uh, reserve a little bit of time um, for, um, for questions from the folks participating today. Sure, I could uh, jump in first. Um, so it certainly, and this was mentioned earlier about sort of password resets. Um, I mean, the first thing you want to do is of course, make sure that you've kicked the attacker out of your environment. Because if one of your very first steps was to reset people's passwords, in the environment that the ones that you think are compromised, but the attacker is still in the environment. I mean, they're just gonna still have access to your environment. It doesn't really change anything. So you certainly wanna kick everyone out of your environment and then work towards uh, most likely password resets if they got in. And that, that applies to just about any system you're dealing with. Um, there are, as mentioned, the backups that you have uh, in your environment. So, you know, hopefully you have functional backups and you've been testing them. Um, but what you wanna watch out for and this is where the forensics is very important, is making sure when the attacker actually got into your environment, because they may have gotten in today, which is great, then you restore from yesterday, or they may have gotten in a month ago, and hopefully you have the logs that can show that, but if they got in a month ago, then you have to, you can't restore from yesterday. It's possible they may have dropped a, a, some sort of system to remote access into the environment or so, some other method for them to sort of regain control, even if you restore from a backup. Uh, so there may be situations, and, and this will be uh, likely, you know, work through the attorneys and the security company you work with or the forensic company you work with, they may provide you the, the recommendation on sort of what to do in terms of how to restore from your environment, whether that means restore from, go ahead, the entire image, uh, which is great, because then that saves you time, or they tell you only restore the files, which means you're going to have to rebuild a Windows server from scratch and just restore your data, because they just simply don't trust what's on those backups. Um, and then I'd say for security improvements, I would, I would also include, you know, if you got fished because, you know, somebody got duped by an email, but you don't have MFA, like that's a problem. That's a security feature you should turn on. And if it resulted in, in a security breach and you've cleaned up that mess and you're like, great, all right, let's go back to business as usual. Like, that's not a good idea either. You certainly want to implement MFA and sort of plug that hole, that gap. Uh, as quickly as possible, ideally before you sort of reopen the doors again, because you're just going to put yourself back in a position of risk if another user gets fished again. Okay. Jada, Dina? So I agree with everything Joseph said. And when I think about this, I, um, I think it's important to learn from each event. Hopefully you don't have a lot of events. Um, but after our event last December, we took a look and said, 
what can we learn from this? How can we um, make sure this doesn't happen in the future? Or what can we do to help it not happen? Because mm -hmm. you can't be 100%. Um, in our case, we made a lot of changes. We implemented a new vendor portal so that um, banking changes go through that and individuals can't make them. Uh, we, we changed processes in our accounting shop. We implemented multi-factor authentication um, for even our grants management system, which drives people crazy to no end, but it's really necessary. Um, we implemented so many technical recommendations from the company that our cyber insurance brought in to review our network and systems. And so I think it's important every time this happens to make changes. Thank you, Dina. I'm unmuted now. Um, yes, adding, adding, agreeing heartily with Jada and Joseph, I guess, um, and maybe you've talked about this earlier, but the part that I would add is, um, you know, the balance between, you know, it was a big cultural change for our users. Their um, need to get work done, to get back to work, um, and you having to be sort of the gatekeeper of um, when that can happen in a secure way. Um, so making sure that you have your senior management staff wholeheartedly involved in all of your meetings, um, that your senior staff isn't subverting your own security, um, you know, keeping keeping all of all of that understanding um, and and really prioritizing the security over the access, which um, can be really difficult, especially in you know our offices where there's so much of a need for people to have access and do. But there is sort of a finite amount of time where now you have their attention because everybody's traumatized and trying to, to as Jada said, learn from that moment and seize on that moment um, and, and try and move your organization forward um, into that sort of more, so, you know, more secure uh, realm and awareness. Um, I just want to uh, I want to recognize Daniel for um, for his short comment that this can be the most stressful thing that anyone deals with in their career. I am like you know eight months you know of, of this and just really still cleaning up from it. And it's like PTSD listening to all of this. I'm like oh the the contact with the bad actors. Oh the negotiation. I mean it's so important that you have the right people on your team. I mean you you don't want to try and handle this alone. Um, I, so I want to, there are a couple more questions I'd like to ask the panel, but I, but I, I really want to make sure that if, if folks who are, are, have called in today have any questions that they, they post them in chat. One question that I did get um, uh, was, you know, I guess to the extent that a, um, an account's compromised in this, in this instance, uh, you know, a, a fake job posting gets put up and you have applicants for the, the, this is the scenario, applicants for the job posting who's, you know, responding. I mean, is there, I guess... Um, I'm trying to abstract this a little bit, but I get, what's what's our obligation to, uh, I guess, and maybe this is too um, uh, too generic to answer, right? To to notify people who, in this case, who might have applied for a job that that doesn't exist, and maybe sent a sent their resume to 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 Russia or China or or just to you know some 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 bad actor domestically. Um, you know, do do we need to sort of figure out um, who might have responded? Um, to this, I mean, I know that within the legal aid community, even and and with government uh, agencies that, that that we've worked with, sometimes one person will notify, you know, the other organization that you know we think that that there was a compromise, and and we, you know, I think we always appreciate it, and I guess we always expect that we're going to do the same. But uh, any thoughts on some, you know, beyond sort of I guess the disclosure requirements? This is this is sort of somebody who might might have been hoodwinked. So I think I'll jump in. Um, I, I think, you know, as far as um, disclosure requirements go, um, typically the way the data breach notification laws are worded, the data owner has the obligation to provide notice to individuals whose personal information was involved in an incident. So one sort of tricky thing with the scenario you described is determining who's the data owner, you know, is what if the if your organization's system was actually um, somehow compromised and, and somehow they added something to your website or something like that, mm -hmm. 
that that would be a scenario where you may decide that you need to notify individuals of that. Um, but the other thing too, though, is that in the United States, at least, resumes typically don't have information contained within them that would rise to the level of personal information that would trigger a notice obligation. Mm -hmm. um, other countries um, do often include things like a passport number um, or, um, you know, mm. date of birth, things like that I've seen um, in, in other um, resumes. Not sure how that would really play in in, in that kind of scenario here. Um, but I think it would be really difficult in that situation to identify who sent, um, you know, their resume to the bad actor, because mm -hmm. I would assume that the bad actor would put, you know, whatever their email address is that they created for this scenario. Um, so I think it would be really difficult to determine who you needed to notify. Um, but again, if it's somebody from the U.S. sending their resume, um, I think typically that wouldn't trigger notice. Um, but it would be unfortunate. We've seen some scenarios that I wouldn't really call them a cybersecurity incident or a breach, um, but something like where somebody's website is being spoofed or, or something like that, which is not really a cybersecurity incident in, in a strict sense, um, but is something certainly that organizations do have to um, sometimes deal with, unfortunately. And I guess, again, it's sort of like the value of talking with with counsel or, or sort of analyzing each situation on its its fact pattern and, and making a judgment call because it may also be your brand. It may be your yeah. trust in the community. It may not be an obligation, you know, that the, the state statute sort of prescribes. Um, uh, so I don't see other questions. Hopefully we haven't, we haven't, I don't think we've, we've, we've traumatized people too badly today. I think that this is, it, you can get through it. I mean, I think that's I, as, as, as hard as it is, you can get through it. What we want is for, there'd be fewer incidents and for the, the, the um, response to be as, as uh, I don't know, orderly, as, as thoughtful um, and rapid as, as it can be. And, and that you're preparing for it by reducing um, some of your, your um, uh, uh, risks, like, like not having logs that Joseph mentioned. So if you have, it were, you know, log retention, if you're, if you've got more data for the forensics teams, they can help identify more of what's gone on, um, or if you're not collecting social security numbers, or you're limiting the number of, of folks that you keep that information on, what, what, you know, what can you do so that if you are compromised, the, the size of that damage is, is, uh, is lessened. Um, so I guess maybe on that, on that vein, and this is sort of a question to the whole uh, panel, um, uh, based on your perspective and experience, what would you, what, what do you think would be the top thing that you suggest organizations change today to um, have a, uh, um, a better, a, a more restful night's sleep when they start to think about cyber incidents? Uh, I can jump in. <laughs> I can jump in. I think from a technical standpoint, I'm probably the biggest one I'd say that, that should be implemented across the board is, is multi-factor authentication. And most people will think, okay, yeah, I'll get MFA turned on on my email and then just kind of call it a day, but it's really not just that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing some sort of remote access into your environment with a VPN or remote desktop or some other method, uh, log me in or these third-party systems, make sure that has MFA as well. If you have a case management system that's online, if, uh, if your accounting system, anything, and everything should be covered with multi-factor authentication. And in those situations, I mean, uh, you know, there are users who will dislike it uh, a lot, but it's just really a matter of, and maybe this doesn't apply to everywhere, but I, when I leave my house, I bring my keys with me. And that's, that's basically multi-factor authentication. I, in order for me to get back home, I have to use my keys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Jada? Can I add on to that, to what Joseph said? When you're buying new services, don't buy them if they don't have, if they don't support MFA. I can't, I'm having this, this struggle right now, and boy, does it drive me crazy. Um, but that's what I would say. Don't even consider them and tell the vendor why you're not buying them. Right. And then the policy thing that I would say is, Think about how you're going to handle this sort of thing ahead of time. Put a policy in place. I think Elise said early, she finds that most of her clients don't follow that policy step by step. 
We didn't follow our policy step-by-step step either, but at least we had something written down that guided us. Mm-hmm. And it was a it was sort of a backbone for how we handled things. And I would suggest to everybody to write down your incident management process. Wonderful. And and sort of a preview of, uh, of the ITC conference uh, session we're going to do, we're going to try to do a little workshop on incident uh, response policies. Um, I'll, I'll throw my, uh, my two cents here. Um, I'd say this is true for almost any organization. Get rid of data you no longer need. The storage is cheap. Two, two thumbs so up. It used to be, and I think, uh, John, you mentioned earlier, right? You see these hacks come in. People would try to, uh, like, use uh, uh, server or file uh, space to save data because it was expensive to do it yourself. Now no one cares, right? It's cheap. You can just yeah. keep buying more and cares. And so organizations will just say, well, look, it's not costing me anything to keep data going back 10, 15, 20 years. I got customer data, I got employee data going back. I'm keeping it, you know, sensitive information in my email account because who cares? I can do it and it's not costing me anymore. And that's exactly the type of, of risk you're now increasing because once an, uh, a threat actor gets into your environment, they've got this treasure trove. So if it's not there, there's nothing to take, there's nothing to compromise, whether you've moved it out, you've archived it, you've deleted it. Probably one of the biggest things right there, I think, from a data governance perspective, organizations can do to limit their risk. Great, great. Kaylee, Elise, Dina. I'd mostly just be just be echoing um, echoing uh, what the others have said because my my top hit list is, you know, MFA right away. Um, oh my God, those logs! Make sure that you've got like detailed logging turned on because you want to know what happened. And it can really inform um, you going forward. And um, so that's something you can do in the beforehand. Like I sort of, since you're covering all the big, you know, the biggies, it's like, what can you do really fast? What can you do today? That's like really easy. Um, do that right Log away. And retain those logs, make sure you keep them. Yeah. Make sure that everything, your firewalls, your servers, like all your logging is on. It can be, you know, really, really helpful. Um, so. Thank you. Kaylee, Elise? I agree with what everybody said. Go okay. ahead. That's, that's <laughs> a thumbs up. Excellent. Well, um, I really appreciate um, everyone uh, joining today and, and, uh, and my uh, special thanks to the, to the panel. Um, uh, I hope this was uh, useful um, uh, for, for everyone who, who, uh, who joined in and um, again, want to um, urge you to um, look at the other um, sessions that we've done as part of this series. And, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to um, uh, the ITC conference where we're gonna do another um, uh, somewhat similar session with a slightly different um, uh, focus um, and, uh, and working with uh, Ladeirdre and, and finishing up the cybersecurity uh, toolkit, um, which will be sort of a, um, a starting point um, and hopefully a, a, a launching off point to help uh, other you know, help the provider community move forward um, in some significant ways um, to advance their own cybersecurity practices and readiness. So um, thanks again. I uh, hope everyone has a great uh, holiday. Coming up in several weeks, 